Well, good morning. Thank you all for joining us amid your busy schedules today. We're so glad that you're able to join us. My name is Chell Miller. I'm the Communications Director at the New York State Coalition Against Sexual Assault, and I'll be your MC today. We're gathered today to amplify the concerns of survivors and survivor advocacy groups in response to former Governor Andrew Cuomo's continued abuses of power and those complicit in an ad campaign attacking survivors and the agencies that are investigating him for workplace sexual harassment. First, we're going to hear from our colleagues at Vera House, uh, Randy Bregman and George Kilpatrick. Then I'll provide a statement on behalf of the New York State Coalition Against Sexual Assault. And after that, we will have time for questions. My colleague, Max McAuliffe, is standing by to address any questions as needed as well. So first, I'm honored to introduce my colleague, Randy Bregman, co-executive director at Vera House in Syracuse. Thank you, Randy. Thank you, Joe, for the opportunity to be with all of you this morning. And thank you to those of you in attendance uh, at what we think is a very important juncture in our history in New York State. Uh, if you care about sexual harassment, if you care about sexual assault, if you care about victims and survivors, I think it's very important that we start to raise voices to challenge this ad that has been developed. This is not about politics. I think the governor and his team are talking about politics and political maneuvering. And we, as victim advocates, are talking about the experience of victims and survivors of the abuse of power, the harm that is caused by harassing behaviors, many of which in most environments don't necessarily rise to the level of a crime. And so not having a criminal case has been my experience in the vast majority of sexual harassment cases that we've been involved with at Vera House in the 31 years I've been here. Sexual harassment is an offense that happens in the context of a workplace that many times may not be a crime. But not being a crime does not mean that harm was not caused. If you think about in your own family situation and you think about a really difficult day with someone you love and they're yelling and screaming at you and calling you names and bringing up the things that are most hurtful to you and you feel like you can't sleep that night and you can't get through that day, you've been harmed, but there's no crime to report. The governor's incessant focus on the fact that prosecutors in New York couldn't make a criminal case on these sexual harassment claims. Those of us who've been advocates for sexual assault know how hard it is to meet the standard of a sex crime in New York State. That is irrelevant to the facts of this case, the reality that there was a thorough months long investigation that supported the credibility of 11 victims and to continue to attack the reality of that report and those victims experiences re-victimizes victims and causes further harm. And our ask as a victim advocacy organization who loves and cares about survivors is that stations don't take the money to run those ads, that we take a position in our state that says, this is not okay. And like the governor has said in some of this earlier work, enough is enough. I would say enough is enough in terms of the campaign he is running against these victims. Thank you for the opportunity to be with you this morning and be happy to dialogue more. And I'm happy to pass now to George Kilpatrick. Good morning, I'm George Kilpatrick. And uh, thank you, Randy, uh, for those words. And I've been at Vera House as the co-director of prevention education for about 10 years. And in my role, primarily, I have been engaging men and youth uh, to do just this, to prevent sexual assault, domestic violence, and other forms of abuse. And in that work, we have a program that is called the 12 Men Model. And in that program, we bring groups of men together to pretty much redefine masculinity, to redefine what it means to be a man, and to look at our own actions as they may have contributed to an environment where violence could occur. It may have been through words. It may have been through our actions. Whether we knew that at the time or not, it is about examining and taking a look inside to see what could I have done. As someone who's done the work, I've had to do that. What I'm concerned about here is that the governor is refusing, the former governor is refusing to be accountable 
to the survivors and to the actions that he committed, and some of which he admitted to, to doing. That's my main concern here, is that what we would have preferred to have seen is him saying something in an ad that apologizes to the survivors, that, that recognized that he may have caused harm, whether he intended to or not, and that he's going to work to do better and to be cognizant of the words he uses or the actions that he takes. I, what I'm asking uh, for is all male identified individuals uh, who to stand up and say, this is not acceptable, that we have to hold each other accountable, that we have to stop and interrupt these actions when they're occurring. And as Randy said, those stations that are, are, are accepting those ads in some ways are complicit in creating an environment that continues to harm survivors. We've got to stand up, folks. We've got to, we've got to say no. And we have to, we have to again, look within to, to assess our own actions. And that's what we're, we wish that the governor had done as opposed to what he did. And so uh, I look forward to, to, to engaging for the dialogue about this. But what we see here very clearly and very starkly is a failure of accountability. Thank you, Randy and George. It's difficult to follow such powerful words, uh, focusing on, you know, seeing what harm is and can be and relying on, right, criminal ideas of what harm is. And an important call for self-accountability for, for men and for all of us to identify how our behaviors contribute to environments and cultures that perpetuate sexual violence, harassment, and abuse. I'm going to share a statement now on behalf of the New York State Coalition Against Sexual Assault, or NISCASA. We're a private nonprofit coalition of community-based rape crisis programs located throughout New York State. Our mission is to end all forms of sexual violence and exploitation and to address the impacts of sexual assault, abuse, and harassment. Niscasa condemns all forms of power-based violence. Sexual harassment has always been harmful and it can have devastating consequences for survivors and victims. Multiple investigations have revealed that Andrew Cuomo did engage in repeated sexual harassment and other forms of uh, abuses of power while serving as the governor of New the state of New York. We've seen Andrew Cuomo and his legal team question the credibility of survivors who've come forward with stories of sexual harassment and other abusive behaviors. His taped response to the Attorney General's August 2021 report minimized the harm that survivors experienced and told them that they can't trust their recollection of events. Now the former governor has released an ad campaign framing himself as the victim of political attacks. We're collectively witnessing a man whose repeated abuses of power are well documented continue to abuse his power and privilege and position as he faces a federal lawsuit for sexual harassment and inappropriate touching. The ad campaign, ostensibly to rehabilitate his public image, only serves to re-traumatize victims and delegitimize the attorney general and the other agencies that have been tasked with investigating his actions. Though Niscasa is disappointed to see the halt of further action into the former governor's behavior by various district attorney's offices, Andrew Cuomo and the people who have enabled this behavior must be held accountable to the fullest extent possible by themselves, by their community, and by the broader New York State community. True accountability, as George pointed out, requires apologizing in a meaningful way to the people you've harmed and understanding the impacts that your actions have caused on yourself and others. It involves making amends or reparations to the harmed parties when it's possible and changing your behavior so that the harm, the violence or the abuse does not happen again. In this case, accountability could mean many things. It can start with ending this harmful ad campaign and ceasing public attacks on the attorney general and other agencies that are investigating your behaviors. It could also mean not running for public office again. 
Above all, we believe accountability must be informed by the expressed needs and wants of the people who have been harmed. We invite the legislature to strengthen protections for workers and to implement policies that prevent workplace sexual harassment and promote accountability for people who engage in abusive behavior. And finally, we invite the media to make a choice. You can choose to prioritize profits over truth and run these ads at the cost of silencing survivors across New York State, or you can choose to respect the dignity of his victims by refusing to run the ads. What will you choose? Thank you. At this time, we'll address any questions that we may have in the Q&A box uh, from members of the press. And you can also use the chat box if you have questions too. If you're here on the phone, um, please dial star nine to raise your hand. Um, if you'd like to ask your question using uh, your microphone, you can also use the raise hand function and we can promote you to a panelist so that you can ask your question. Thank you. I don't see any questions yet in the Q&A box, but please feel free to um, raise your hands and I can allow you to talk or you can ask your question in the chat box. I don't see anything yet. Um, While we wait, um, and hopefully folks will have questions, um, Max, would you like to share Ms. Casa's policy statement so I folks can have to. it? Thank you very much. Um, you know, good morning, everyone. I'm the public policy director with NIST Casa. Um, I recently joined, and we're moving full steam ahead uh, with our uh, priorities, and I'm excited to, um, you know, join the organization. Uh, in addition to our statement on the former Governor Cuomo and holding him accountable for the sexual violence that occurred, uh, NISCASA would like to highlight the policy strides towards addressing sexual harassment in the workplace. Noted in multiple press releases on Tuesday from New York State legislators, in particular, the New York State Senate. Uh, the following summary of legislative advancements, NISCASA would like to emphasize and are proud to stand behind are as follows. Bill S-738, the Let Survivors Speak Act. Bill S-766, the No Rehire Ban. Bill S-566A, which extends the time frame for reporting complaints, including sexual harassment and assault. Uh, Bill S-5870, which provides a resource for sexual violence victims who experience unlawful workplace retaliation. Many more initiatives have moved forward uh, that NISCASA supports as well, including the toll-free confidential workplace sexual harassment hotline. Uh, we're here and ready to do what we can to assist these measures in any way possible. Um, if you have any policy questions, I'm here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Max. I see a raised hand from Daryl Camp. I'll give you one moment. All right, Daryl, take the question. Yes, yes, on the policy front, um, there were seven bills in the package that you had just mentioned that uh, I believe most, if not all of them, had passed the Senate earlier this week. Uh, do you feel optimistic that they will pass both houses and then be signed by the governor? Yes, definitely. Um, yeah, we. which by the way, um, we support all of those that were listed. Um, you know, we just wanted to specify particular ones uh, that directly correlate, um, you know, with the, the instance that we we're mentioning involving uh, the former Governor Cuomo. Um, but we are overall um, optimistic in terms of these, uh, these bills moving forward, uh, especially the uh, sexual harassment hotline. Um, just a follow up to that. In 2019, the former governor had the women's agenda that he was pushing. Do you all find a, sort of a sense of irony in that he was sort of championing lowering what is the standard for sexual harassment 
in the workplace, uh, considering the events of last year? I probably wouldn't use the word irony. I would probably use the word betrayal. That to me, um, it's particularly painful to have someone who led some of the most significant policy changes in New York State to advance addressing sexual assault, sexual harassment, relationship violence. I, I think Governor, former Governor Cuomo's policy choices were things that really advanced a lot of the causes that we've been working for for many years, in my case, for more than three decades. But to have somebody who advanced language that, unlike some states, says that anything that rises above the level of trivial would be considered sexual harassment. And clearly, some of the behaviors that have been described, running your finger up somebody's back, for many of us, we do not consider those behaviors trivial. And to know that he pushed that language and then won't take accountability and recognize the really hurtful impact he has had feels much more like betrayal to us. And there was one more, just back to the policy side. Uh, specifically, there were two measures, one from Brad Hoyleman and one from Senator Gudnardis, uh concerning the statute of limitations. And a lot of people, it seems to be common knowledge that there is often a delay between when events transpire and when events are reported. How critical, if you believe it's critical at all, I, I don't want to presume, uh, would you say that giving people as much time to respond as possible is when dealing with these situations, considering the general apprehension? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for that question. Um, I would like to revert back, you know, uh, to, that you were mentioning to S566A, you know, extending the time frame for reporting complaints, including, of course, sexual harassment and assault. Um, you know, we're going to look more into the specific initiatives that you mentioned, but uh, absolutely, it's, a, it's imperative that we, uh, that the time frame is extended, um, you know, just to consider trauma-informed uh, care um, in the non-traditional sense of, um, you know, validating the, the victims at hand and, um, you know, doing that myth-busting that, um, unfortunately, a lot of people say, you know, when invalidating victims of why didn't they report it immediately. Um, this is an extremely, you know, traumatic event in most cases that occurs. So, you know, definitely we're looking into um, supporting extending that time frame uh, with other bills as well. Yeah, and if I can add to that, thank you, Daryl, for this question. You know, something that we have all seen working directly with survivors is sometimes when you're experiencing harm, you don't recognize it as such right away. It Sometimes you process it much later and realize as, as you've heard other people come forward or as you've learned more about what constitutes sexual harassment, you can realize it much later. It also, you may need to take time to bring up the courage to speak, to tell someone, because that can be terrifying if you don't know if you'll have support or if you don't know that somebody can help you. And increasing the statute of limitations for on, in this situation and many others with other legislation we've supported really builds in a much more trauma-informed timeline for survivors. Thank you, I appreciate that. Thank you, Daryl. If anyone else has questions, please feel free to use the raise your hand function or add it in the chat. Um, I'd like to address to one of the earlier questions that Daryl asked regarding um, the, the kind of irony or the betrayal that Randy pointed to. Um, something that Niscasa has, has spoken openly about is when we position ourselves as leaders in the work to address and prevent sexual and gender-based violence, we actually have to hold ourselves to the same standards that we're holding other people. And we need to make violence prevention an everyday practice, including in our workplaces, in our personal relationships. As you know, Randy and George and Max can attest to, this includes creating a culture of consent, where we respect the dignity, autonomy, and the boundaries of our peers, both physically, emotionally, and in any way. And we fail to meet those standards 
we undermine any efforts we've made to end violence. And we do, as Randy said, we betray people who are looking to us for leadership and positive change. And if our actions are causing harm and we're perpetuating violence, um, we need to take full responsibility and act accountably. And that's something that we have not seen from the former governor, as George pointed out. All right, thank you. I don't see anyone else with questions, um, but feel free to raise your hand or add it in the chat. We'll start to wrap up shortly. Um, do any of our speakers here um, have anything else they'd like to add that you think folks should know? I mean, I just, I love what you just said about creating a culture of consent because uh, a lot of our workplaces, uh, that isn't possible. We, we see this in many areas. Uh, I know that uh, when we do our training, we were sometimes before survivors who, while they're in the same room as the person who they've got a claim against, right? And, 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 that, and what we've learned is that sometimes the environments, the workplaces, the places that we are in, don't create a space where survivors are protected or believed. So I, I love this ideal of changing the narrative to how do we create a culture of consent that gives space for survivors to speak and for also for, for people who intentionally or unintentionally cause harm to be, to check themselves and be rehabilitated. Because we know that as, as we've been talking here that uh, not everything rises to a criminal level, but it's still uh, harm caused. And so uh, I'm encouraging from my lens, male identified individuals to, to really take this work seriously and to examine our own behaviors, examine our conversations, examine the cultures that we have allowed, right? We've been silent, we've all participated, some of us, I won't say all of us, but some of us have participated in conversations that we probably regret now right, or actions that we regret. We now know better and we should do better. And I think this is where I come back to the former governor. He knows better, he should have done better. Um, I would like to briefly add to, you know, um, going off of uh, reiterating what George was saying, um, it's crucial, especially with our policy that we um, not just create blanket measures, we have to address um, the systemic historical uh, issues at hand. And uh, I would just like to say, I'm really um, proud of a lot of our state legislatures, uh, legis excuse me, legislators, both in the state Senate and the assembly for um, acknowledging this and creating content that um, this address these issues from a holistic lens. And probably the one last thing I would want to say, we, we've we been talking about this for a couple of days here at Vera House in Syracuse, and we've had some negative feedback from people who are posting, how could you do this without all the facts? And um, I, I want to say that one of the reasons we're making sure our voice is here, and I hope that voices are added to those of us on the screen today, we want survivors to know, victims and survivors, we believe you. You are not alone. People stand with you, even when powerful figures continue to re-victimize. You are not alone. Help is available, and we want you to get the resources and healing you so deserve. And that's part of why I think it's important for us to come together and keep having these conversations, even when people are going to resist hearing this message. Yes, thank you. Thank you for that important statement. Um, I was really interested in also bringing a statement to the victims and the survivors who may be watching, who may be seeing media airing the commercial. Like Randy said, you are not alone. Um, in New York State, if you've experienced sexual assault, harassment, or abuse, 
the New York State Hotline for Sexual Assault and Domestic Violence is always there as a resource. That number is 1-800-942-6906. And if you call that hotline, you can get connected to victim advocates in your community, including Vera House out in Syracuse. Thank you. Thank you all again for joining us at such a busy and difficult time and with short notice. We're so glad you could make it and we appreciate all of your efforts. Thank you especially to Randy, George, and Max for sharing your voices and your truths and some difficult truths that a lot of us need to hear.